I asked one famous physicist, I said, you know, um, in light of the astronomical odds that had to be met for life to exist and for the universe to support life and so forth, um, uh, what do you think of the idea that it could have happened by chance? And he looked at me and said, well, we physicists have a, um, have a term for that. I said, what is it? He said, ain't going to happen. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green, and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first-round pick with an eight-year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son, Troy, each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey, and everyone's got a story. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. Lee Strobel, I am so excited to talk with you. You first appeared on the national stage when you broke the story for the Chicago Tribune about how Ford Motor Company knew that a flaw in the design of their Pinto would and did cause the vehicle to explode in some low impact crashes. And a few years later with your best selling sensation, The Case for Christ, where you used your prestigious investigative journalism skills to try to debunk Christianity, but end up becoming a believer. The book has sold over 14 million copies worldwide. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Well, thank you so much. It's wonderful to be with you. It's an honor to meet you, Tim and Troy, and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Let's begin your story before you were even born. You were a surprise. Your parents thought they were finished with diapers and baby bottles. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, my uh, dad was an attorney, uh, had his own um, firm where he did independent insurance adjusting. He was quite successful. Um, we had uh, five children in our family. Um, three of them came pretty quickly. And um, I think they, my mom and dad kind of figured that was over. Uh, my dad kind of threw himself into raising them and, you know, was the coach on the little league team and and uh, the booster at the high school for sports and all that stuff. Um, and then I came along. I was kind of a surprise after a gap of um, quite a few years. And uh, it was not a pleasant surprise to my dad. I think he had plans to move on to other things in life. And um, so I never really had a good relationship with my dad. Um, we were quite a bit at odds. We saw things differently. Um, a lot of friction in our relationship. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that in some ways contributed to me going down the path to atheism, because when you look at the famous atheists of history, Camus, Sartre, Nietzsche, Freud, Voltaire, Wells, Feuerbach, O'Hare, all of them either had a father who died when they were young, divorced their mother when they were young, or with whom they had a very difficult relationship. And the implication is if your earthly father has disappointed you or let you down or hurt you, you don't want to know anything about a heavenly father because he's only going to be worse. And so the tendency then is to kind of be open to more of an atheistic uh, worldview that I don't believe that there is an eternal father. And uh, I think that may have been a factor in my life. Um, I like to think that my objections to Christianity were based on intellectual uh, issues that um, trouble me, but I can't rule out the possibility that uh, psychologically I may have been primed to go down that path of atheism because of the difficult relationship with my dad. In fact, um, um, Freud talked about this, and um, C.S. Lewis had a antidote for this. If any of your listeners are saying, "Yeah, maybe that's a contributor to where I'm at," uh, C.S. Lewis said, "Imagine what the perfect father would be like." He would be loving, he'd be gracious, he'd be kind, he'd be your biggest cheerleader. He said, that's a picture of your heavenly father. That's the father you really want to have. 
And, um, you know, God the Father is not just a magnified version of our earthly father. He is much more um, much more different than that, more glorious than that, more loving than that, and kind and gracious and so forth. So, um, but I think in my life, it probably did open the door for me to go down the path toward atheism at a rather young age. You grew up with some siblings. What are they up to now? And do you keep in touch with any of them? You know, my oldest brother, Ray, uh, died of COVID. Um, he was one of the early victims of that uh, virus that went around a few years ago. He was uh, in his, he was 76 years old. He had just had heart surgery and they put him in a nursing home to recover and he caught COVID and died. And um, so he's no longer there. My older sister, Judy, uh, is going through uh, dementia. And um, I just visited with her. She's at a home for memory challenge people um, in Chicago. And I just spent some time with her and uh, she's doing well, but um, suffering the effects. Uh, she's in her 80s and suffering memory uh, issues. And so that's difficult. Uh, my brother, John, lives in Atlanta, Georgia. He's a, um, a great guy. We connect uh, periodically. Uh, my younger sister, a, after I was born, my uh, parents decided I needed a playmate. So they had one more child who is uh, my sister, Lorena. And uh, she's a doctor of uh, education, uh, retired now, lives in the Chicago area, and uh, is a, uh, a Christian as well. Well, you mentioned uh, your sister's a Christian and your, you know, your dad earlier. Was your, were your parents religious growing up? You know, my parents were members of a um, Lutheran church, Missouri Synod, if that tells you anything. Um, so they were fairly active in the church, but they kind of had the view that you let your kids kind of make up their own minds uh, once they get to a certain age. So they put me through some religious training when I was a kid, uh, which I didn't enjoy. Um, but I dutifully went through it and said the things that they wanted me to say. And then, uh, kind of graduated from that when I got into high school and, uh, they kind of let me go on my own path. And uh, that was the path of disbelief, of atheism. You were interested in journalism so, at an early age. Did your father have some ritual with the newspaper that got you hooked? I think most of us started out with the comics or the sports page first. I guess I'm asking what drew you to journalism. Yeah, I got excited about journalism as a young kid. My dad would bring home the Chicago Daily News on the train uh, from work every evening. That was a real writer's newspaper. So I used to read that front to back and I read the Chicago Tribune in the morning. I love the idea of having a front row seat to history, as a journalist often does. Um, in fact, when I was about 12 years old, I started a neighborhood newspaper. Uh, I printed it in the basement in a little printing press. I uh, came out every week. Uh, I had advertisers. I interviewed the mayor of our little town and the police chief and others. And um, had about 200 subscribers uh, and um, charged, I think, $3 a page for a full page advertisement. And uh, that lasted a couple of years. We actually, uh, NBC News did a feature on, on me and on my little newspaper that was on the Huntley Brinkley Report. Old people remember the Huntley Brinkley Report uh, on uh, NBC. And uh, they actually did a little feature on me and, and my newspaper. So I love journalism from the earliest age. I want to be a writer, but not just a writer, someone who covered the news, someone who was an eyewitness to history. And um, you know, so I knew from the beginning, I wanted to go to the University of Missouri, which I consider to be the best journalism school. And then I later went to Yale Law School uh, because I began to specialize in covering more legal trends and issues and things, uh, court decisions and things like that when I was a reporter for the Chicago Tribune. What did your parents say when you said you wanted to start a newspaper or did it kind of happen organically? It kind of happened organically. I mean, I, uh, I initially printed it on a thing called a hectograph. Now, none of your listeners are going to know what a hectograph is. A hectograph is literally a pan of gelatin. And you would type a master um, of what you wanted to reproduce. And you would lay it down on the gelatin and lift it up, and the words would stick to the gelatin. And then you would take a blank piece of paper and put it on there and pull it off, and you'd make copies. So you could make 50 or maybe 60, maybe even 100 sometimes copies 
on this pan of jello <laughs> and um and then and then I got a uh, a mimeograph machine, a model uh, ninety from the AB Dick Company, which was their first one introduced during World War II, and um, it was pretty primitive. I had to take parts from my mother's rotisserie uh, when I wanted to print something and, and to make the printer work because it lacked some parts that it needed, and uh, began to print it on a mimeograph machine. So. Uh, one of the people who got excited about what I was doing happened to be a guy who was the production manager of the Chicago Tribune. And mm. um, he wrote down in his little diary, well, Lee Strobel's going to be graduating from journalism school in 1974. Check him out. Well, in the interim, he became the president and publisher of the Chicago Tribune. And uh, wow. so he actually sought me out when I was graduating from the University of Missouri Journalism School. And um, I had an interview and got the job uh, right coming out of school as a reporter at the Tribune. Wow. So my little yeah. newspaper paid off in the end. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> By then you had the $3 ads. You were, That's you were right. living large. Yeah, I was living large. <laughs> <laughs> at 12. At 12 years old, you're slinging newspapers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You were only 14 years old when you met your future wife, Leslie. How did you meet? Yeah, um, I was, it was a day after Christmas. We were 14 years old. Um, I, I was with a friend. We took the train to downtown Chicago to just walk around like we used to do. And um, I saw another friend of mine across the street and he was with a girl and he saw me and he said, Strobel. And I said, yeah, hey, Clay, how you doing? And so I came over and he introduced me to Leslie and um, it was love at first sight. I mean, she went home and told her mom, I met the boy I'm going to marry. And uh, wow. so I, I got her phone number and stole her away from my friend. And um, <laughs> uh, we dated on and off in high school. We broke up a couple of times. But um, when I moved away to go to the University of Missouri, she followed me and uh, worked at a bank and uh, helped put me through school. We got married after our sophomore year. And, um, so I, we've been married 52 years now. And, uh, even though we're pretty young, I'm 72, we got married at 20 and, uh, she was 19. And, uh, so there's some benefits to getting married young. I mean, we got grandkids. I got a granddaughter who's 18, just went away to college and, um, I'm hoping I get great grandkids before too long. So, um, <laughs> I'm grateful we met at a young age. <laughs> You're, did, you, did you have to buy your friend a soda or something after that? You feel it grow. <laughs> he, he sort of disappeared. I, I think he lives in Reno, Nevada now, but uh, I think he's in real estate now. But um, uh, she said later, she said, yeah, I just wanted to, to go out with him to get his ID bracelet. <laughs> your relationship with your dad was strained. You found yourself always trying to please him to no avail. But what was your relationship like with your mom? Um, I had a good relationship with my mom. My mom had become a Christian when she was 13 years old and um, in Florida and um, had a vibrant faith. Um, she went to church every Sunday. She, um, she was a really special person and um, her faith shined through her in a lot of ways. Um, my dad was um, on the board of directors of the church, given his law background. They thought it'd be good someone have someone trained in law on that board. Um, but he was less overt in his beliefs. And, um, uh, as I say, I think he kind of let the kids carve their own path based on what they thought was best. You, you mentioned that before too. Do you think, I guess, is that something you, uh, I'm trying to think the way to say this. Is that something you would, you would say is, um, is a problem for you? I kind of, one of the things that I thought about growing up is, we grew up and my, my dad's Christian and my mom's Jewish. Yeah. And so I kind of felt like we had, we kind of got our own paths because it wasn't neither. We weren't pressured necessarily either way. Yeah. And that's one of the things I find that, you know, I really am, am very um, ignorant with religion, truthfully, but I also kind of like the fact that now I'm later in life because I feel like it's more meaningful versus I have people I know in my life who grew up and it's, there's nothing wrong with it, but they grew up their whole life being told their religion X, Y, or Z, yeah. and they still are that religion. It's like they never really stress tested it in a way. Yeah, yeah. Not that you have to, but sure. What do you think about that? Well, I think that you know, I, I ended up in the right place, so it, it turned out all right. 
Um, uh, you know, I think it's always a little tricky um, how you raise your kids. You don't want to force feed them something. Uh, on the other hand, I think you want to nurture in them um, a, a curiosity about God and and uh, point them toward what you believe to be true, that God exists, that Jesus is his son, that forgiveness is available, that he loves us, that he has a plan for us and a future for us and heaven awaiting us and so forth. Um, so, you know, the Bible says if you train up your children right, um, they'll, they'll come back to the faith. And I think that's often true. I, I was given religious training as a kid because my kids, my parents did attend a church. Um, I didn't believe it, but I, I think it did plant something inside of me and um, um, kind of gave me a, a sense of direction and a sense of at least what Christians believe to some degree. Um, but it wasn't until later when I, as you use the term, I like your term, stress tested, uh, when, when I kind of put it to the test and, and uh, really did the investigative work to determine whether or not there was anything that pointed toward Christianity being true. Um, you know, coming to that conclusion kind of on my own, made it my own. And um, uh, so in the end, it worked out to be okay. But I'm not sure, you know, raising my own kids, uh, I tried to um, uh, nurture them in a household that was centered on God. And, um, you know, my son is a professor of theology at a seminary, has a PhD in theology. My daughter is a devout believer and um, homeschooling expert. And um, uh, so they they have found that path uh, to be um, the right path for them and um, brought them to their own faith in God. Growing up, so. you were raised in a Lutheran church, but when you were a freshman in high school, you took a biology class. And when you learned about Darwin's theory of evolution, you disregarded God for science and disdainfully, I might add. Yeah, I did. I, I learned in high school that uh, God is out of a job because I was taught that neo-Darwinism explains the origin and diversity of life. So you, what do you need God for? Um, now, I don't believe that's true anymore. I think uh, science, especially over the last 50 years in the area of cosmology and physics and biochemistry, points powerfully toward the existence of a God who uh, matches the description of the God of the Bible. So I think science is a friend of faith, uh, the Christian faith anyway. Um, but, uh, you know, that's not what I was taught. I, I was taught that you don't need God because naturalistic processes can explain how life came into being. And then from there, um, uh, through natural selection, acting on random variation, uh, various species uh, emerged and uh, eventually so did humankind. And we somehow got consciousness there's a lot of unanswered questions, frankly, in neo-Darwinism. Uh, Neo-Darwinism really can't explain the origin of the universe. It can't explain the origin of humankind. It can't explain the uh, um, origin of life of any kind. Can't can't explain the origin of human consciousness. So, you know, there's a lot of holes in the neo-Darwinism account. Um, but for a young guy like me, it was it was liberating because it meant that I didn't have to buy into the morality of uh, my parents' religion. Uh, I was uh, unleashed from that and could um, follow my own desires and not worry about um, crossing um, the lines of this imaginary God that they had. So uh, it did, the neo-Darwinism did, um, in a sense, liberate me from the need to believe in God, at least for a while. So for, for evolution, do you think that if they did, let's just say they found, I think they're relatively close, but if they found the link, you know, they keep talking about that. I've been, since I was whatever in elementary school, yeah. I've been talking about the link that they're close to finding. But if they found a link, the, the, the you know, half monkey, half man, half ape, half man. <laughs> I mean, would you, is that something that, do you think evolution is at odds with God? Or do you think it's, you know, I don't know, I guess, kind of God's way? Or what, what's your thoughts on that? Well, there are Christians who believe that God used the evolutionary process to um, create humankind ultimately. Uh, they're called a theistic evolutionists. And they believe that um, the odds of evolution happening on its own are so monumental that there needed to be God to guide that process, in a sense, um, toward an outcome. 
Um, so there are Christians who believe that evolution uh, makes sense. I think mm -hmm. there's too many problems with it. Um, we all believe in evolution to some degree. That's why we have 200 varieties of dogs. Um, so microevolution, which is the variation between kinds of animals, everybody agrees that that takes place. There's, there's no question about that. But can you can can evolution explain um, movement from a single cell organism all the way to humankind uh, over the eons of time? I don't believe that makes sense. I don't believe the evidence is there. Uh, um, and in fact, I wrote a book called The Case for a Creator that critiqued that evidence. But I think more importantly, um, discoveries over these last 50 to 80 years uh, have pointed toward uh, the existence of the Christian God. Uh, just a quick example is cosmology, the origin of the universe. Where did the universe come from? Well, um, whatever begins to exist has a cause. We now know that the universe began to exist at some point in the past. Therefore, the universe must have a cause behind it. Well, what kind of a cause could bring a universe into existence? Well, it must be transcendent. In other words, it must be separate from creation must be immaterial or spirit because it existed before the material world, must be timeless or eternal because it existed before physical time came into being, must be powerful given the immensity of the creation event, must be smart given the precision of the creation event, must be personal because you had to make the decision to create, must be creative because my goodness, just look at how beautiful and wonderful creation is, must be loving because he so carefully crafted a habitat for us to live in, and Occam's razor, the scientific principle of Occam's razor, would tell us there'd be just one creator. Well, what have we got? Transcendent, spirit, eternal, powerful, smart, personal, creative, loving, unique. That is a description of the God of the Bible. And so science is a friend of Christianity. And cosmology points toward a creator who matches the description of the God of the Bible. Um, so, um, my new book is God real, uh, delves into these areas, looks at the fine tuning of the universe, how our universe is fine tuned on a razor's edge so that life can exist in a way that defies the idea that it could be by mere accident. Um, we look at the information in DNA in every cell in your body. There's more information, uh, in a four letter chemical alphabet that spells the, way that all proteins out of our bodies have to be made, um, there's more words in every cell in our body than in 200 years of the Sunday New York Times. Where does information come from? Um, nature can produce patterns, but it can't produce information. In other words, if you walk down a beach and in the wet sand, you see ripple marks, you could say, oh, nature made those patterns. The waves made those patterns. But if you see in the wet sand, John loves Mary and a heart around it and an arrow through it, you wouldn't say that, oh, nature created that. Why? Because nature can't produce information. It can produce patterns. And so I think biochemistry or genetics, um, physics, the fine tuning of the universe, cosmology, the origin of the universe, point toward the existence of a creator who matches the description of the God of the Bible. And by the way, it rules out polytheistic rev, uh, um, religions, which believe there are many gods. It also rules out pantheistic religions, which believe that everything is God. So modern science is a friend of Christianity, it goes a long way toward explaining the origin and diversity of life. Uh, so I, I no longer... Uh, you know, I don't believe the evolutionary processes were used by God to create humankind. But even if it did, even if he did use that, that would not negate the fact that uh, that there is a supernatural creator. Yeah, I remember I was uh, in, in preparation for this. We, we read your book, The Case for Christ, one yeah. of your books, I should say. And the statistical level, like the likelihood of something happening is like trillion, 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 trillion. I mean, it's just it's so it's so unbelievable, and uh, yeah. anyways, I'm I I think more maybe this is the from law school, but I think more in that in the pattern of the book is like you're putting the case together, and yeah. I think um, yeah when you hear the number like when you when you think like oh it's so unlikely that it could happen yeah versus seeing how many zeros <laughs> the odds <laughs> are of it happening yeah. it is uh, yeah it is breathtaking I mean, it's it's unbelievable. 
Yeah, literally. It, it really is. It really is. And the parameters that are necessary in physics for life to exist are so astronomical that it's just silly to say that, oh, it just happened by chance. Uh, I asked one famous physicist, I said, you know, um, in light of the astronomical odds that had to be met for life to exist and for the universe to support life and so forth, um, uh, what do you think of the idea that it could have happened by chance? And he looked at me and said, well, we physicists have a, um, have a term for that. I said, what is it? He said, ain't going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> What are, are there other kind of big things like the, the formation of the universe? Yeah. Are there other big items like that? that? Yeah. I mean, the fine tuning of the universe, which I hit on a little bit, but the, the, Mm -hmm. you know, that's a separate, separate issue, how finely tuned the universe is. It's, it's absolutely mind boggling. Um, I'll give you an example. The ratio between the electromagnetic force and the gravitational force, which is a ratio that has to be exactly right for life to exist. Um, is finely tuned to one part in 10,000 trillion, trillion, trillion. So how do we understand? What are the odds that that could happen by chance? It would be the same as taking a billion continents the size of North America and piling them with dimes that went all the way up to the moon, 238,000 miles. So you got a billion continents the size of North America, dimes piled up to the moon, and you take one dime and you spray paint it red and you mix it among all those dimes. And then you blindfold someone and say, you can only reach in one time and pick out one dime. What are the odds? It would be the dime that had been colored red. One chance in 10,000 trillion, trillion, trillion. So um, you, know, you look at that and you go, the idea that this happened by chance, it's just one parameter. It's just one. There's about 50 to 100 of these. Um, uh, gravity itself, if you picture a ruler across the entire universe, 15 billion light years, broke down into one inch increments, that represents the potential range along which the force of gravity could have been set anywhere along that ruler, but it is set at the exact right place so that life can exist. What if we moved it one inch compared to the 15 billion light year width of the universe? intelligent life would be impossible anywhere in the universe. I mean, it's just, it's just absolutely mind boggling. And as I say, there's about 50 to hundred of these parameters. Another one is a strong nuclear force. That's what binds together the nucleus of atoms. If you were to decrease the strong nuclear force by just one part in 10,000 billion, 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 all you would have in the universe would be hydrogen. No life would be possible. So you've got these 50 to 100 parameters that have to be perfectly calibrated so that life can exist. And I go, you know, to believe that that happened by chance is just absurd. It points toward a God who not only created the universe, but created it in such a way that we can have a habitat where life can flourish. You you said earlier, too, it, it takes out polytheism. Why is that? Because Occam's razor is a scientific principle that says, don't manufacture um, causes to achieve an effect beyond what you need. So in other words, I mentioned mm-hmm. the what kind of a creator you would have to have, be transcendent, he would be eternal, he would be immaterial, powerful, etc. All these parameters, um, um, you don't have to uh, to, uh, you know, the, the outcome of that is the creation of the universe. Um, you don't need to manufacture more causes to explain the universe. Um, and so why would you need multiple gods if, if one God, the way I described him, would exist? I guess that's a way to put it. Uh, uh, there's no need for multiple gods. Uh, one God explains it all. For college, you ended up going to Missouri to study journalism. Leslie followed you and found a job at a bank. You did plan on marrying Leslie, but just not as soon as you thought it would happen. Can you tell us that story? (laughs) Yeah. You know, back then, uh, before the internet, before cell phones, you would uh, make a long distance phone call from college to your parents about once a month or so. And so I call my parents one day, just my mom, just to kind of check in. 
And I, I said to her, because I didn't really have much to talk about, I said, uh, you know, Leslie and I are going to get married. And uh, meaning after college, someday we're going to get married. But she thought I meant right away. So her reaction was, oh, my goodness, that's great. Uh, well, we'll get the country club for the reception. And and she hangs up and, and Leslie was there. I said, Leslie, I, I just had the weirdest conversation with my mom. And then the phone rang. It was Leslie's mom. My mom had called her and said, hey, the kids are getting married. So I said, I guess we're getting married. Let's get married. So Because I didn't think my parents let me get married at such a young age. I mean, I wasn't even 21. I couldn't drink alcohol. At our wedding, we had champagne glasses with milk in them um, because we were too young to drink uh, champagne. So... Um, uh, you didn't uh, correct the mistake. You just kept going. Yeah. I, 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 okay. Let's get married. I mean, we knew we wanted to at some point just thought, how are we going to do this in college? But it worked out. Uh, <laughs> so I, we, it kind of happened a lot sooner than we thought. I, and I, I'm glad we did because um, as I say, it, uh, um, it unfolded um, for our benefit ultimately. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> the miscommunication got sped yeah. up the wedding. Yeah. <laughs> I'll never forget that. Oh, I'm so excited. Oh, that's great news. Oh, that's exciting. I'll get the country club for the reception. What, what did you do after? Did you propose or how did you do that? Well, I, I said, I guess we're getting married. So that was my proposal. <laughs> she said, okay. So that was it. <laughs> Not very romantic. Her mom calling saying, I guess you guys are. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. That. Her mom kind of confirmed it. So there's no turning back now. I mean, <laughs> took the pressure off. Right. <laughs> <laughs> How and why did you attend law school at Yale? I mean, I know why someone would want to go to Yale Law School, but you were already a thriving professional <laughs> at that point. So why law school and how difficult was it to get accepted? Yeah, I um, when I went to the Chicago Tribune, um, soon thereafter, I became uh, uh, a courthouse reporter. I covered criminal courts. I covered federal courts, major trials, corruption trials, um, crime syndicate trials, um, all the major trials that were taking place in Chicago. And so I, I, I had an interest in law. My dad was a lawyer and, um, and I was approached by the Ford Foundation and they said, we have this special um, fellowship uh, for journalists who want to go to Yale Law School to get a Master of Studies in Law degree so that they could cover law um, for their newspaper um, and be more informed and, and have more depth of what they write about. So I thought, great. So um, I got this fellowship from the Ford Foundation, went to Yale Law School. It was a wonderful experience. Um, studied law, got a master's degree, and um, um, ended up focusing on reporting on law for the Tribune, covering major trail trials now around the country, covering the legal profession, covering Supreme Court cases and things like that. So I really gravitated toward the study of law. I never wanted to practice law. I didn't want to be a lawyer. Uh, you know, it's funny. You talk to a lawyer and if he's lucky or if she is lucky, they have one really outstanding case in their entire career that maybe is like a newsworthy kind of a case. Well, as a journalist, I just cover the big ones. I don't, I don't have any <laughs> routine cases that I cover. I cover all just the big stuff. So I'd rather focus on the big stuff. And um, so I got to cover a lot of major trials and, um, and uh, really, really enjoyed uh, that as a career. And I think yeah. law school trains you to think. Uh, it trains you to ask questions. It trains you to be... Um, uh, to demand answers and to demand evidence and so forth. And so when I did begin to investigate Christianity after my wife became a Christian, um, my legal training was very, very helpful. Um, you know, I can look at, you know, do we have eyewitness accounts? How well was the record preserved? And uh, what other um, corroborative evidence is there and so forth? Um, so I kind of approached it from the lens of a ever legally trained journalist. It's hard for me to tell jokes through the communicator, but compared to some of the lawyer jokes I've heard over the years, you're being too kind. You're talking to two lawyers over yeah. here. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. I'll tell you an interesting story, though. When I was at Yale, 
one of my heroes, he wasn't at Yale, but he became a hero of mine from the distance, uh, was the, the most successful defense attorney who ever lived. Um, his name was Lionel Lucku. Uh, Lionel Lucku, as a defense attorney, won 247 murder trials in a row, either before the jury or on appeal. He was in the Guinness Book of World Records as the most successful lawyer who ever lived. And he was a skeptic about the resurrection of Jesus, which is the linchpin of Christianity. Um, until someone challenged him and said, uh, by the way, he was knighted twice by Queen Elizabeth. He became uh, a member of the Supreme Court of his land. And um, um, he was a skeptic toward the resurrection until someone challenged him and said, Sir Lionel, you're the, you're the most successful lawyer who ever lived. Have you ever taken your monumental legal skills and applied it to the historical record and come to an informed decision about whether or not Jesus rose from the dead? And he said, no, I haven't, but I will. So Sir Lionel Luck, who, as I say, Supreme Court member, um, knighted twice by Queen Elizabeth, most successful defense attorney who ever lived, uh, studied the historical data for the resurrection of Jesus Christ for several years. And, and I'll, cite, I'll recite to you one sentence he wrote that summarized his conclusion. He said, I say unequivocally that the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof, which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. This mm. from the greatest defense attorney who ever lived. And um, uh, he later left the legal profession and became an evangelist to tell other people about Jesus who proved his divinity by returning from the dead. Um, interestingly, I told that story at a big church in Southern California when I had moved there and a woman came up to me afterwards and she said, um, Hey, you just moved into my neighborhood. I'm your neighbor. I said, Oh, that's great. She said, yeah, I'm Sir Lionel's sister. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was a sister of this great legal mind and expert who investigated the resurrection, became a Christian. And uh, she gave me some of his private papers and, that he had uh, had when he did his investigation. So forth, confirmed the story hundred percent. And uh, I thought that was a great uh, example of a coincidence. <laughs> yeah. What are the odds of that? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you picked the red dime. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> So you move back to Chicago and you end up at the Tribune as an investigative reporter. And on top of that, they made you the legal editor. This had to be your dream job. It was my dream job. I loved it. You know, the wonderful thing about being a, a reporter covering major trials is that you're not out there in the rain covering some 511 alarm fire. Um, you're in a nice, comfortable courtroom and this drama plays out right in front of you. <laughs> so it's really kind of convenient <laughs> that you can witness and be a witness to these incredible cases. I covered some incredible um, uh, nationally significant cases um, and some fascinating crime syndicate cases and um, uh, political corruption cases and so forth. Very involved, very, and some of them lasted, one case I covered lasted 18 months in front of a jury, a civil case, um, you can imagine. Um, so I found it quite fascinating and it was kind of a culmination of a lifetime dream. This is when you discover the Ford Pinto cover-up. You were nominated for a Pulitzer and you won a big award in Illinois. Can you please tell us about the case? That must have been extremely satisfying. Yeah, it was a, a landmark case in many ways. Um, three young girls were burned to death in a rear engine crash of their Ford Pinto in Indiana uh, on their way to a church camp. And um, um, the Pinto um, had been, it was a subcontact car developed by Ford, had a tendency to explode when hit from behind in a low or moderate speed rear end collision. Uh, there were about 60 people burned to death in Pinto collisions like that around the country. Well, for the first time in American history, a prosecutor charged a company, Ford Motor Company, with homicide, reckless homicide for the way in which it designed the car. The theory being, if the car had been responsibly designed, these girls would have walked away with minor injuries. But because it was um, um, designed improperly, um, that caused it to explode. They were killed in the, in the accident. Um, uh, so it was a big front page story around the country. Um, and what happened was rather interesting. I got a tip one day that said, Hey, Strobel, 
go check out the public court file on the Ford Pinto case. So I went to the courthouse and I got the file and I looked inside and Ford Motor Company had filed a series of motions called motions in limine. And what that means is they, they were saying, look, we don't want this issue to come up before a jury. So let's litigate it before the case goes to the trial. So they didn't want the jury to see crash tests that showed that the car tended to blow up when hit from behind in moderate or low speed collisions. Um, well, they attached the secret Ford crash test to the motions that they filed. And all of a sudden, here I've got all these secret Ford memos that documented that they knew that when hit from behind at low and moderate speed, this car could very well blow up. Um, And so I had a court uh, enforce exclusive because a Ford lawyer saw me going through the file. He ran into the judge and got an order sealing the file. So no other journalist could see this file, but it was too late. I had already photocopied these documents. And so I had this court ordered exclusive and um, I had headlines and every newspaper in the country um, three days in a row um, exposing the what Ford knew and, and why they didn't build a safer car. Um, now, in the end, Ford was acquitted because the car in which the girls were driving was not of the same year that the ones that were crash tested were. It was a couple of years later and it was a little safer, but they, it was difficult to quantify how much safer. And so Ford was found not guilty in that case. But um, uh, the, the significant thing legally was the case was ever brought in the first place. And um, I wrote a book about it. It's my first book called Reckless Homicide. And um, it goes through that case. A lot of lawyers use it because it, it was a landmark case. It was sort of the, the, the connection between criminal law and product liability. And uh, so it's an unusual situation. And um, uh, so I, I, was, uh, I did receive um, the highest award from United Press International in Illinois for public service journalism. Uh, for uh, reporting that case and and exposing that stuff. How old were you at that time? Gosh, I was probably twenty five or twenty six. It must have been pretty a pretty great feeling seeing your name on every paper and the headlines. Right, it, it was pretty remarkable. Um, it, it was pretty remarkable. In fact, I've got on my wall. You can't see it here, but I've got a, a copy of the award that they gave me, where the front page of the Chicago Tribune is reproduced and printed on bronze. Um, the headline is Ford ignored Pinto file fire peril secret memo show. And, uh, it's, it's just sort of, it was the initial article that I wrote documenting, uh, this, uh, scandal. Professionally, you were on fire, but all was not well. You were drinking heavily. Your five-year-old daughter, Allison is frightened of you. And you have an incident where you kick a hole in the wall. What was going on with you? Yeah, I, you know, I, I lived a life consistent with my atheism. Uh, if there is no God, then to me, the most logical way to live my life would be as a hedonist, someone who just pursued pleasure. And that's what I did. And so I lived a very immoral, drunken, profane, um, narcissistic, uh, self-absorbed uh, life. That was my life. And, um, and it affected my family. Um, um, I remember one day, um, getting in an argument with my wife, um, uh, because she wanted to go to church and, and I was angry about it and I just blew up. I had so much rage inside of me. Um, uh, and, and I blew up and I kicked a hole right through our living room wall. And, um, my little daughter, Allison was crying and my wife was crying. And I mean, that was just another day in the Strobel house. So I, I was, um, I was living a life consistent with my beliefs. Uh, there is no God. What does it matter? Um, and, um, you know, so I hurt a lot of people along the way uh, and uh, caused a lot of strife and turmoil in our family. Of course, when my wife became a Christian, the tension got ratcheted up even higher. Um, and the conflict in the marriage really came into focus. Did your, Were you acting like that? Like, was your kind of behaviors that pushed her towards Christianity or was it something else? Um, yeah, I mean, I was, I was, um, 
and this sounds stupid, but in a way, I felt like my wife was cheating on me with Jesus. In other words, here she's got this mythical creature named Jesus Christ, who she now loves and is following and is living according to the way he thinks people ought to live and serving him. And I'm like, well, where's that leave me? You know, I, I thought I was the guy in her life. Um, now, that sounds stupid, and in many ways it is, but, you know, that's, that's kind of how I was feeling. I, I, I felt like I was losing her. I felt like she was being pulled into this Christian subculture where I wasn't welcome because I was an atheist. And um, so it just made me madder, and, and it made me more determined not to believe for quite a while. Um, I remember once she, she talked about wanting to give some money to the church. And I said, I got a good idea. Why don't you just flush it down the toilet? I said, that'd, that'd be the same thing. You know, um, you give it to the church, flush it down the toilet. It's the same, same effect, same outcome. Um, so that was, that was the kind of attitude I had. It was uh, increasing um, anger toward the faith because I felt like it was pulling my wife away from me in our marriage. One of the turning points was when your wife, Leslie, joined the church. You were pretty disparaging towards her about it. What made you end up going into the church yourself? Yeah, my, my wife wanted to go to church. I discouraged that because um, either I was babysitting the kids while she was at church or um, whatever, or I wanted to go to Wisconsin and, and go for a bike ride on Sunday instead of uh, her going to church. And so that caused a lot of friction in our relationship. Um, and, and then one day she invited me and I thought, you know what, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to this church. Maybe I can rescue her from this cult that she's gotten involved in. And uh, so I was January the 20th of 1980. Uh, I went with her to a church and um, was shocked because I heard the basics of Christianity in a way I'd never understood it before. And it amazed me because I thought you try to be a good person. If you were good enough, God would let you into heaven. That's what I thought Christianity was. And the pastor said, you know, you can't earn your way to heaven. Uh, we're all sinners. We've all fall, fallen short. We've all violated the commands of God. We've turned our back on him. And for that, the natural outcome of that is separation from him for eternity. Um, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. That salvation, eternal life, is a free gift that you, you can't earn. You just need to receive in repentance and faith. And that just seems so counterintuitive to me and um, really opened my eyes. And well, wait a minute, maybe there's more to Christianity than I understood before. And um, it kind of opened me up to checking things out um, um, and using my legal background and journalism training to begin to really investigate whether there's any credibility to Christianity or not. What caused you to try and use your investigative skills to prove Jesus was not the Messiah? You investigated for nearly two years and concluded what? Yeah, it, it became very clear to me very quickly that the resurrection of Jesus was the key to everything. Um, did he or did he not return from the dead and thus prove he's the son of God? Because clearly he made transcendent and messianic and divine claims about himself. At one point, he got up before a group and he said, I and the Father are one. And the word in Greek there that's used for one uh, is not masculine, it's neuter, which means Jesus was not saying, I and the Father are the same person. He was saying, I and the Father are the same thing. We're one in nature, we're one in essence. And the audience understood what he was saying because they picked up stones to kill him because they said, you, you're just a man, you're claiming to be God. But I thought, so what? I could claim to be God. Anybody could claim to be God. But if Jesus claimed to be God, died, and then three days later returned from the dead, that's pretty good evidence he's telling the truth. And so I realized the resurrection is the ball game. And that's why I poured a lot of my investigative efforts into the historical evidence for the resurrection. And um, I, I, you know, I often use three words that begin with the letter E to summarize what I found. The first E stands for execution, that Jesus was truly dead after being executed. 
You know, not only do we have multiple accounts of that in the documents of the New Testament, there are five ancient sources outside the Bible that talk about the death of Jesus. In fact, no less of a source in the Journal of the American Medical Association, a secular medical scientific journal carried an investigation into the death of Jesus and concluded, quote, um, clearly the weight of the historical and medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead even before the wound to his side was inflicted. So the first E stands for execution. Jesus was dead. The second E stands for early. In other words, we have early reports that come very quickly after the death of Jesus that he rose from the dead. Why is that important? Because as a skeptic, I used to think that um, the reports of the resurrection were a legend. And I knew it took time for legend to develop in the ancient world. So I figured, you know, 100, 150, 200 years after the death of Jesus, legends developed, mythologies were spun, and that's where the idea of the resurrection came from. What I found out is we have a report of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that has been dated back by, and we, by the way, has named eyewitnesses and groups of eyewitnesses in it that has been dated back by scholars to within months of the death of Jesus. I mean, that is a news flash from ancient history. That is far too quick, to, I believe, to write it off as just being a legend that developed over the decades after his life. This is a news flash that dates back within months of his death. And then we have the third E for empty, the empty tomb. And the biggest evidence there is even the opponents of Jesus implicitly conceded that the tomb was empty. Everybody admitted that the tomb was empty. And then the fourth E stands for eyewitnesses. Uh, not only was Jesus' tomb discovered empty, but over a period of time, Jesus appears alive in a dozen different instances to more than 515 people, to skeptics and doubters as well as to believers, indoors, outdoors, daytime, nighttime. People touched him and talked with him. They ate with him. In fact, I found nine ancient sources inside and outside the New Testament that confirm and corroborate the conviction of the disciples that they encountered the resurrected Jesus. That is an avalanche of historical data. And so I just, I just came to the conclusion uh, after a couple of years of studying this, that Jesus not only claimed to be the Son of God, he backed up that claim by returning from the dead. And to me, that's the ball game. Was there a moment in your research where, because you obviously went into it trying to disprove it, yeah. was there a... Was there a light switch moment where all of a sudden you went, oh, wait a second, something might, something, <laughs> I might be wrong on this. Yeah. Or it was it just slowly over time? It happened slowly over time. Um, when I was little, uh, you're too young for this, Troy, but when I was little, they used to have these uh, punching bag things that they would make for kids. It was a toy and it was an inflatable thing. There's weighted on the bottom and it was an, a clown and, and it was a punching bag. And so you would hit the clown and it would go over, but then because it was weighted in the bottom, it would pop back up. And then you'd hit it again, and it would do the same thing. That's how I pictured the evidence as I investigated it. I would hit it as hard as I could as a skeptic, trying to disprove it. And it would go back, and then it would bounce back. Oh, there's an answer to that. There's another bit of evidence. And so I'd hit it again, and it would go back, and then it would bounce back. And it just, I'm telling you, it absolutely shocked me. I literally thought I could disprove the resurrection of Jesus in a weekend. And here it took two years to conclude that it was true. Um, but I have to say that when I did my investigation, I did it as a journalist. And I was trained at the University of Missouri in the old days that journalists did not take a position. They tried to be like an umpire in a baseball game and call a ball a ball and a strike a strike. So that was kind of the attitude I tried to approach it with. Yes, I was a skeptic. No, I didn't believe it. But I was going to try to weigh the evidence as honestly as I could and be like an umpire. Okay, that's a strike. That's a ball. And, and just let the strikes and balls come out the way in the end that they would. Um, so I tried to keep an open mind as best I could. Uh, through the process. And so over time, as the evidence kept mounting up, uh, you know, my attitude kind of began to change. And I began to see that, wait a minute, this is not fairy tales. It's not make-believe. It's not legend. It's not mythology. There is actual historical data that support the claims of Jesus. 
And um, I, I was astounded by that. I'm, I'm still astounded by how much data there is. When did you know that your journey was going to be a book? Oh, not for many years. Um, you know, it all came down to November the 8th of 1981 when I realized the evidence was in, I needed to reach a verdict. And um, that's the day when I kind of reviewed all the evidence and, and stepped back and said, I believe it based on the date of history. I believe Jesus not only claimed to be the son of God, he backed it up by returning from the dead. G- Christianity is true. And I read John 1, 12 that says, but as many as received him, to them, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. And I realized just believing it was not enough. I had to receive this free gift of forgiveness and eternal life that Jesus purchased for me on the cross when he died as my substitute to pay for all of my sin. And when I would receive that free gift of salvation in a prayer of repentance and faith, then I would become a child of God. So I got on my knees and I poured out a confession of a lifetime of immorality that would absolutely curl your hair. And at that moment, I received complete and total forgiveness through Jesus, and I became a child of God. And then over time, everything began to change. My values, my character, my morality, my attitudes, my worldview, my perspective, my parenting, my marriage. I mean, all these things over time began to change for the good. And, um, um, you know, it wasn't an over, it was an overnight thing to receive this free gift of forgiveness, but then the process of growth and, 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 and shedding this lifetime of a narcissistic atheism, um, took some time. And, um, um, but now I was working in tandem with my wife. Now we're, now we're on the same page and, um, uh, it, it, it did wonders for our marriage. And as I say, now we've been married for 52 years. Did you just start to approach? Because I, I remember one part of your book that stood out to me is when you when you did that confession, you got on your knees. Yeah. You said it didn't it didn't just like everything didn't just change instantly. Like you yeah. mentioned it did take time. Yeah. Did you just when you Some, would approach situations, you would just think how would I don't know, kind of like that class, like what would Jesus do or something yeah. like that? Or like how did you how did you change? Yeah, I mean, um, some people talk about an emotional encounter with God at the moment they come to faith. I didn't have that. For me, it was the rush of reason. It was the rush of truth. It was the rush of this is reality. And when I put my trust in Jesus, I mean, theologically speaking, the Holy Spirit takes up residence inside of you and begins to help you navigate this new life in Christ and to open your eyes to a new way of seeing things. Um, second Corinthians five seventeen says, when you, when you come to faith like that, uh, the old is gone, the new is come. Um, and, um, so you do begin to change in a, in a Christ honoring way. Now change takes time. Um, I was a heavy drinker when I was uh, an atheist. My hobby was getting drunk. I was the friendliest guy in the bar. Um, I, I would be the guy who would go around at midnight and buy beer and refill everybody's mugs. And um, I mean, I, I was a friendly drunk uh, and, and, and I enjoyed it. Um, when I came to faith, instantly that went away. And I, I don't have that desire anymore. That isn't true for everybody who has a problem with alcohol, who comes to faith in Christ. Many times, that's, it's a long battle to overcome that. But now you have the power of God in your life to help you through that process. Um, for me, it was instantaneous. Um, but for others, it's a, it's a process. And, and so the moment of conversion, the moment of being saved, so to speak, the moment of being adopted as a child of God is a moment in time. But then the process of what they call sanctification or growth in your faith, that's a, uh, that starts then and continues the rest of your life. Um, and, and so that's a process that continues to this day. I still sin. I still screw up. And, um, and, and it's still a process of, of walking closer and closer with God over the years. Um, so I think that's an important distinction. And one other thing, too, about this is you're 
you you build the case so well and, and it presents so well and it seems like so clear cut conclusive <laughs> but if it was that black and white you know do you think everybody would be like oh yeah it's obvious right and, <laughs> and go to it so what do you think the challenge is or why do you think there still is such i don't know po- there's so much popularity in other religions if if uh you know you think it is that black and white case closed yeah, that's a great question. I, you know, biblically speaking, um, uh, the Bible says that we tend to suppress truth, that it's in our nature and not to want to find God. It's in our nature. In fact, the, the Greek imagery that's used in the book of Romans is like a pedal on a car. And, and, and when, when truth begins to raise its head, we begin to see that we push down that pedal to suppress it because we don't want, we, we want to be God. We want to make the rules. We want to live according to the way we want to live. But we don't really want to have a, 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 a father in heaven who's going to tell us how we should live our lives. And so biblically speaking, our tendency is to suppress the evidence. Um, so I think that explains why a lot of folks don't find God, so to speak. They're, they're happy in their state and they ignore or suppress evidence that points in the other direction. Besides which, how many people really do what I did and spend two years of their life really plumbing and investigating the evidence? Most people don't. They'll take somebody's word for it. Oh, my my, my rabbi told me it's not true. Don't pay any attention to it. Okay. I trust my rabbi. I'm not going to look into it. Uh, my imam told me that uh, Christianity is based on a corrupted book and can't be trusted. Okay. Well, that's good enough for me. I'm going to follow my imam. Um how many of us really investigate? I mean, I read the Quran um, when I did my investigation. I investigated whether whether uh, Islam could be true. And I found that Islam specifically in the Quran denies the very things I would need to believe to be a Christian. It denies that Jesus died on the cross. It denies that God has a son. It denies that anyone could bear the sins of another. Um, and, and so... Islam and Christianity cannot be true at the same time. They can both be false or one can be true, but they both can't be true because they contradict each other. If the Quran is true, the Bible is false. If the Bible is true, the Quran is false. So I had to investigate do I, which, which book do I trust? What are the credentials of those books? Um, how many people really do that? I don't think a lot. Um, and, and so I would just encourage anybody who's curious to do the work, do the work that I did. Really investigate where does the evidence point? The evidence of science, the evidence of history, the the arguments of philosophy. Do they point toward atheism, uh, or do they point toward Christianity? Do they point toward Buddhism? Do they point toward Islam? Or where do they point? Um, and you know, I think God honors that when we, with an open heart and an open mind, you know, the Bible says in the Old Testament of Jeremiah. I will seek you and I will find you when I seek you with my whole heart. Uh, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament says um, that those who sincerely seek God are rewarded. So I would say to anybody, check it out. Do what I did. Investigate it yourself and come to an informed conclusion. Um, and, and if you want to focus on something, focus on the resurrection, because if that's true, then it changes everything. That means Christianity is true. And if that's true, that means other faiths are not true. And it means that atheism is not true. Is that what led to, for, for I guess, disproving in your eyes the, the Quran was that Christianity was true? Or was there other things in that document, in that text that, you know, when you read, it pushed you away? Yeah, I mean, I, I looked at uh, the history and how the Quran came about. For instance, um, you know, I have first century evidence that Jesus claimed to be the son of God and backed it up by returning from the dead. And I asked my Muslim friends, well, what, what have you got? And what, what do they have? They have, they have a, a prophet in a cave 600 years later who says, no, it's not true. Well, set aside faith. Let's just look at where does the evidence point? I got all of this evidence from the first century that Jesus claimed to be the son of God, died and was resurrected from the dead. Um, You've got um, Muhammad uh, 600 years later being told by a spirit in a cave that it's not true. Um, where does the evidence point? 
to, to me, it's pretty clear cut. Um, they can't both be true. Um, I think Christianity has the evidence that supports it in a way that no other faith does. And I'm now just out of curiosity, what about with Judaism and Christianity? What did you find there? Well, the, Christians, of course, believe in, in uh, you know, Jesus is Jewish. <laughs> it, is a, it is rooted in Judaism. And um, the, the um, uh, death and resurrection of Jesus as the Messiah is foretold in ancient prophecies in what we call the Old Testament, what, what the, the um, Jewish people call their Hebrew scriptures. Um, the coming of the Messiah um, is, is described uh, in various ways uh, in the Hebrew scriptures that are fulfilled in the life, death, teachings, and resurrection of Jesus. Um, Psalm 53, written hundreds of years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, um, show that to a Jewish person and say, who is this talking about? I've seen a video where people did this and they, they'd show Psalm 53 to a Jewish person and say, who's this talking about? And they read it and they go, I was talking about Jesus. They didn't know it's from the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it's often called the fifth gospel because it, it describes the coming of the Messiah uh, who fits a, 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 a kind of a fingerprint that Jesus and Jesus alone is able to fit. So as a Christian, uh, I say to my Jewish friends that Christianity is just a culmination of where Judaism was pointing. And um, you, you look at the evidence for wh- how Jesus fulfilled the Messianic prophecies against all mathematical odds, um, and yet he was able to do it. Uh, coming in history at the exact right time, according to the book of Daniel, um, and, uh, you know, fulfilling these attributes of the Messiah in a way that nobody else has ever been able to do. And you go, golly, does this not point toward a fulfillment of where the Jewish scriptures have been pointing? I, I believe it does. I've got many Jewish friends and we talk about it and debate it. And I've got many Jewish friends who have become Christians. And they are what's called a Messianic Jew. They, they believe in Jesus as a Messiah, and um, they, they maintain their Jewish identity to a large degree. Um, and I love them. They're great, great folks. And, and um, um, you know, Louis Lapides is one of them. Uh, Michael Brown's another one. Uh, friends of mine who, who did the research um, and, and came to informed conclusion about where they believe the evidence was pointing. And what's the best, I guess, argument or or that people make about why it sounds like you know Judaism, you know, why what is the best argument you've heard in in that side? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't think there is a good argument that negates the affirmative evidence for Jesus being the Messiah. I, I, um, I, I don't see it. Um, and honestly, in my experience, very few. Jewish friends of mine anyway, uh, until I kind of challenged them, had ever really investigated it, had, had ever really checked it out. Um, so I, I think I think there's a really, really strong case. Um, and I'd encourage anybody, you know, do the research, check it out, come to your own conclusion. But um, I believe Jesus is the Messiah who's been awaited by the Jewish people for centuries. One of the things that uh, one of I, I heard about you a long time, not a long time ago, but I don't know, a couple of years before now that we were speaking, and I would say I would say to people when they would ask me, I'd say, my mom's Jewish, my dad's Christian. I don't, you know, I kind of got a foot in both camps, but not yeah. really. I, I used to say, and you know, my wife, I used to say to her, and then anybody who would ask me, I'd say, eventually, what I want to do is I want to get to a point where my life has a certain level of calmness to it. Yeah. And then I'm going to do, which first of all, is, you know, never happened. Yeah. Right. <laughs> three kids, three kids, about to be four kids later. I don't know if I'll ever get there. But <laughs> I said what I wanted to do was get to a point where I felt like I had some balance. Yeah. And I could really think, because if you're under stress, it's hard to make clear decisions or rational decisions. Yeah. So I wanted to get to a place where I had some balance. And then I said, yeah. what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the research. I'm going to go yeah. look at these other religions. I'm going to travel. I'm going to do it. And I was talking to one of my buddies from law school, actually, Sam Rogers, and he he said, uh, he's like, all right, you'll 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 see in a couple of days. I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> you'll see. 
And then the book showed up. I had no clue. My wife's like, what's this? The, the book literally showed up, The Case for Christ, your book. <laughs> I said to him, like, what, you know, what is this thing? And he's like, just trust me. You got to read it. He's uh, like, what you say you want to do, somebody already did. He's, yeah. like, take the, he's like, take the cheat sheet. You've got the answer. <laughs> and I'm not the only one who's done it. I mean, there have been many others who've done it as well. I, I tell you, um, it is interesting, isn't it, how we think, you know, someday I'm going to take the time to check it out and so forth. And, and uh, you know, back in 2011, um, my wife found me unconscious on our bedroom floor. And um, the doctor, I was taken by ambulance to the hospital and the doctor looked at me and said, you're one step away from a coma, two steps away from dying. And I hovered between life and death uh, for several days. Um that's a very clarifying experience. It changed my life in many ways because I realized tomorrow's not guaranteed. I could have died there. Uh, in many ways, I should have died. When you looked at what was going on, um, I should have died. Um, God took saved me from that. But it, it reminded me that we're not guaranteed tomorrow. Uh, in April of this year, I was at a speaking event in South Carolina, got up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, fell, off, fell over unconscious. And uh, ambulance took me to the hospital and, and um, um, yeah, I could have died. And uh, so I, I, I just want to encourage people to say, you know, don't put it off, check it out. I don't think it was an accident that that book came into your possession, Troy, at the time that it did. Um, but uh it's easy to put off. And, and in a way, because of my wife coming to faith and creating all this turmoil in our marriage and all this anger inside of me, it, it forced me to jump on it and, and uh, to kind of disprove this and rescue her from this cult that she's gotten involved in. And it, it made it a front burner issue in my life. And for many people, it's a back burner issue and they probably never get to it. Um, so I just encourage people, you know, start with my book, The Case for Christ, or my new book is called Is God Real? And it looks at science and, and history and philosophy and so forth. And I think a very accessible way. But don't take my word for it. There's other books out there, too. Read them as well. Uh, do your own check uh, investigation and, and come to uh, a point where you reach the conclusion, is Jesus who we claim to be? Did he Back it up by returning from the dead. That's the bottom line. People ask me all kinds of difficult questions sometimes. What about this? What about that? What about this? And sometimes I look at him, I say, are you saying Jesus didn't return from the dead? No, no. I'm asking a totally different deal. No, no, no. Isn't that really the issue? Doesn't it boil down to that? Because if that is true, it changes everything. So it's a, a bad time, but I have two personal questions that are hard, that might be hard questions. And you might yeah. just say to me that response. Yeah. So the first, the, the two kind of things that I'm hung up on personally yeah. is the first is how do you, how do you, if you've got a, a being that's all knowing, all powerful, all good, all, all of those things, and you have a person, a human that's lives lives by the teachings you know all all the things you want they're good they're honest they're kind of course everybody sins but they're an unbelievable person but they happen to be a buddhist why would that why would that preclude that somebody like that from going to heaven where you can have somebody who's you know the worst thing out there ever a, a, a serial killer or you know any one of those things who then decides in death on death row or whatever that they they found Jesus and that person goes to heaven and the first person you know goes to hell that that's something that just never never made sense to me yeah and I, I wrote a book called the case for heaven that really delves into those issues uh, the short answer um, is that none of us is good um, we're not just sinners we're sinning against an infinite holy God that if we're worshiping uh, Shiva. Or, or, or taking going down another pathway of worshiping a different god, or what? We're we're committing blasphemy against the god of the universe, and saying, no, 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 you're not real, you're not true, you're not who you claim to be. I'm 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 worshiping somebody else. Um, you know who we sin against makes a big difference. If I if I were to punch you right now, not that I could do it. If I were to punch <laughs> you right now. Um, I probably get arrested for battery. 
But if you were the president of the United States and I punched you right now, I'm going to prison. <laughs> you know, for, right. uh, why? Because who I'm assaulting matters. And who we're sinning against is not, it's, it's not a small deal. It's a big deal. We're sinning against the God of the universe. And we have to take that seriously. Uh, having said that, I believe, and, and I believe this is biblical, that anybody in any religion, anywhere on planet Earth, at any time, who reaches out to the one true God seeking him, God will find a way to allow him to come to faith. Um, so what I mean by that is I, I, have, I had a friend who um, uh, was from India, uh, and he was in an area where it was illegal to share the Christian faith. And he grew up um, as a uh, Hindu. Uh, it was raised by gurus, and they taught him the Hindu faith. And he got to be about 17 years of age, and he said, this doesn't make any sense. There are all these contradictions in the Hindu beliefs that they can't all be true because they contradict each other. And he reached out and said, God, I don't know who you are. I, 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 don't, I, I, I feel lost and confused. If you're real, if you're real, reveal yourself to me. And through a remarkable set of circumstances, God brought a couple of missionaries into his life who shared Jesus with him. He became a Christian and later immigrated to the United States and we became friends. Um, mm. So I believe that anyone, anywhere who responds to the light that they have and reaches out to the one true God seeking him will, will have some way allowed for him to come to faith and find eternal life with God. What I, I'll give you another example. There is a phenomenon right now in the Muslim world of Muslims having dreams about Jesus. And these are not just regular dreams. They're more vivid. They're more lifelike. They're more life-changing than anything they've ever experienced. And this is a phenomenon all over the Middle East. I wrote about it in my book, The Case for Miracles. Um, and um, um People don't just go to sleep as a Muslim, meet Jesus in their dream, become a Christian. The dream, and this is how we know it's not just some subjective experience, points them towards something else that leads them to faith. So here's an example. There's a woman in Cairo, mother of several children, Muslim. She goes to sleep. She has a dream. Jesus appears to her. She's overwhelmed by a sense of grace and love and and beauty in Jesus. And they're walking along a pathway and along a lake. And she says, Jesus, tell me more about yourself. And he says, my friend will tell you. She said, who's your friend? And he points to a guy who she didn't even realize was with them walking along this lakeside. She wakes up. The next day, she goes to the crowded marketplace in Cairo, and she sees the man from that dream. And she goes up to him and said, you're the man. You're, she said, whoa, whoa, what are you talking about? You were in my dream. Same face, same clothes, same glasses. You were, And he said to her, did you just have a dream about Jesus? She said, yes. He said, let me tell you about him. He was a missionary. He didn't want to go to the crowded marketplace that day, but he felt God leading him to go that day. He went to the marketplace. She recognized him from that dream. He sat down and opened the Bible and shared scripture with her. Mm -hmm the gospel of Jesus. Now, what does that tell me? That tells me that God loves us so much. He will find a way. If we open ourselves to him, he will find a way to reach us. Um, so, you know, I don't believe God sends people to hell. I believe we send ourselves to hell. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think God is, um, through these dreams, demonstrating the depth of his love for us, that he would go to that extreme to reach people who, many of whom live in closed countries where it's illegal to share the gospel. Um, this is so common in the Middle East that there's ads you will find in the newspaper in Cairo that say, did you have a dream last night about a man in a white robe? Call us and we'll tell you about him. Um, uh, I got a good friend um, who has written about these dreams. And he said, I could pick up the phone right now and call Jordan or call Saudi Arabia and get five new examples overnight 
of how these dreams are taking place. That tells me that God loves us so much that if there's a way, it will be found. And so that's why I say anyone, anywhere, at any time who seeks after the one true God, I believe will find a way to encounter him. But if somebody was this unbelievable person and they just never, say they just were born Jewish, grew up Jewish, never had exposure to it, never, never, I guess, never uh, seeked it, never looked outside of it. That person going to hell seems to me like it's, it's just, it seems almost seems inconsistent because it seems like if you're doing the right things, but to your point there, the sin is questioning it. I don't know. That's, that's been a hang up for, of mine. But. Yeah, no, it's a legitimate question. I, I'd recommend my book, the case for heaven, because it really delves into it in much more depth. But yeah. um, I would say, you know, keep in mind, nobody is, is a, a truly wonderful person. Uh, the Bible, <laughs> uh, in fact, in the old Testament, the Jewish scriptures say our, our uh, good deeds are like filthy rags. Um, uh, you know, we all are sinners. We all have c- committed sins against the greatest being in the universe. And, um, and, and that has to be dealt with. Heaven is for perfect people. Um, none of us is perfect. Somebody has to pay for our sins. We all are sinners. We either pay for our sins ourselves or we allow Jesus to pay for them and we receive forgiveness as a free gift. That's kind of our choice. Um, so it, it's not imp- it's not contrary to logic to say that um, someone would have to atone for their own sins, pay for their own sins. Um, and we're all sinners. Um, keep in mind too that that hell is not a one size fits all circumstance. That there are degrees of hell, and that Adolf Hitler and what he will experience as hell is not going to be like someone who is an atheist who just denies God his whole life and doesn't care to know Him and walks the other way and so forth. Uh, th- there are different degrees um, uh, in the afterlife, but um, certainly what we all want is to spend eternity with our maker, with our creator. And he opens, he's not up there trying to throw problems in our way to deter us. He loves us. Um, and, and so anybody who reaches out, I believe he's going to respond to. The second question is more of a downstream thing because it's, it's after, after Jesus. But when Constantine Constantine, basically, my my very limited reading, you probably know more about the topic than I do. So this is why I'm asking you. Constantine changes Christianity in, in a lot of ways. Um, but I guess the core, the core of it's still the same, but changes how it's celebrated or how how it's how it's practiced, I'll say. Does that cause any issues you know, for you, or do you have any any um, no. qualms with how that? Good. I think it's overblown, way overblown, what people believe in terms of what Constantine's impact was on Christianity. I mean, you're talking about the creation of the uh, canon. What books are we going to accept as part of the New Testament? And this was not some committee that sat there and said, oh, Constantine says he likes this one, so let's put this one in. Or you know, No, um, there, was a, there was a procedure. The, the, the document had to have some connection to an apostolic figure. And, and to be an apostle, you had to have an encounter with the risen Jesus and so forth. So there had to be an apostolic connection to it, um, either written by them or connected with them. Um, it had to be consistent with what we know from the earliest and most reliable documents about Jesus and who he is. And it had to have um, um, acceptance um, in the uh, among the believers who uh, uh, tested it against what we know about Jesus and, and kind of the conclusion that um, it was reliable. So I think we have the best set of documents in the New Testament in terms of what they reflect about the Christian faith. Um, there's some, most of them were not controversial whatsoever. Um, there were a couple that were, took a little time to get them in there. Um, uh, Hebrews um, took a little time. Um, a little more thinking about, but for the most part, the canon of the New Testament, what we believe as Christians, was not set by Constantine. It was set by the early church. It was set by the teachings of Jesus. We have the four gospels that tell us what he taught and how he died and how he was resurrected from the dead. Um, we've got people who knew, knew him personally. 
What about even though like the practicing of it, like being more conversational versus one person kind of talking to the to the group at church versus early Christianity was more uh, like a discussion, a back and forth. Or, there, or there's some thing. stylistic, there's some stylistic yeah. things that have evolved through the years, and that's okay. Um, that's all under the umbrella of orthodoxy. You know, I I go to a certain kind of a church. I go to a Baptist church because I believe the Baptist doctrine lines up best with what I find in Scripture. But I got friends who are Catholic. I got friends who have uh, who are Lutheran. I got friends who have different denominational stripes. But it's interesting. The word denomination has the same root as the word denominator, common denominator. Uh, a denomination, they all have a common denominator, um, and that is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the, the, the non-negotiables about the faith. We all hold closely to those, but it's okay then to have some variation in terms of how we express that. And so my charismatic brothers and sisters may have a very exuberant uh, um, um, uh, service that they attend and so forth. It may be, be more reserved for my Lutheran friends. Um, they're worshiping the same God. They're trusting the same scriptures. Um, they believe in the same resurrection and so forth. So it's okay that things have changed over time. That that it may stylistically, that's okay. Where you get into trouble is where you start dealing with the non-negotiables. Um, uh, you know, that's when you tamper with that, you start getting the creation of what I call fringe religions that, that deny certain essentials of the Christian faith, but still call themselves Christian. That's a, that's a problem. Um, but in terms of stylistic things and, and the way in which church is done through the centuries, is it different today than it was in the middle ages? Yeah. Uh, is it different today than it was in the fourth century? Yeah. Um, but that's okay. That's just stylistic stuff. Um, so it, that doesn't bother me. Cause it still gets to the, in your eyes, still gets the same end result. How they get there doesn't matter as much. It, well, it, it, as long as we're in agreement on the non-negotiables, you know, non-negotiables that, that um, um, Jesus is the unique son of God. Uh, there is no way to heaven except through him. Uh, he died. He was resurrected. He proved his divinity that way. Um, the Holy spirit is God. Uh, the father is God. Um, God created the universe from nothing. I mean, there's certain things that we're sinners, that we need redemption through Christ. Um, there's certain non-negotiables that we all have to kind of sign off on to fall into the Christian camp. But when it comes to stylistic things, it's fine if there's differences. And we ought to celebrate those, I think. I, I celebrate my the, the brothers and sisters in Christ who take a different approach than I do. Um, that's okay. We, as long as we believe the same non-essentials or the same essentials. I was again, very limited, but the, I was reading this book called Pagan Christianity. Have you heard of that book? Uh, I'm not. It, it basically, it talks about Constantine and, and the impact he had on Christianity. And one of the things he said is like, there's just blatant, blatant things were done to basically anti-Semitic. It was like, all right, we need to distinguish ourselves from Judaism. So we're going to do these things different. Like, Mm. The date of Easter, as an example, or not celebrating some of the the high holidays of Judaism, which early Christians would have celebrated, things like that. I wasn't sure. I don't know. There's there's part of it, but I guess to your point, it still ends up in the same place. So I don't know if it if it does if it does impact you know for for you and your thought. Yeah, I mean, I, have we um, have we seen instances in the history of Christianity where anti Semitism has reared its ugly head. Yeah, we have seen that uh, an occasion in, in the history of Christianity. But um, um, we see our faith, uh, as I said earlier, as a fulfillment of the Jewish scriptures. And, you know, we honor Jesus uh, in his Jewish lineage. And, um, um, you know, but the fact that he died and resurrected, the fact he instituted certain uh, sacraments like um, uh, communion and baptism and things like that that um, are an expression of uh, Christian theology. Um, to me, that's not a, 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 a rejection of Judaism. Uh, to us, it would be a fulfillment of Judaism. In other words, uh, you know, it, uh, ancient Jews would sacrifice animals. Um, um, 
and, and what was the purpose of that? Well, it was foreshadowing the ultimate sacrifice that the Messiah would make as he paid for the sins of the world. Um, that doesn't need to be done anymore. Um, and so we don't need uh, a sacrificial system anymore because of that. And so it would make sense that Christians would not expect to have that as part of our um, practices. Got it. Those are my two personal ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have, I've not read that book. It'd be interesting to take a look at it and uh, the background of the author and so forth. But um, yeah, I, I don't see any problem with, um, um, you know, the way that the New Testament is put together. It's, it's, it's more advocating for like Christianity pre- Constantine is kind of the it's it's basically saying Christianity was this thing and it still is the, the core is still the same, but a human changed it pretty dramatically. And maybe it's a you know, again, maybe it's not a right claim. I I I don't know this stuff that well. Yeah. Um, but that's it, it'll I'd be interested to, to, to hear your thoughts and we, you know, if you, if well, you one, of the, out. one of the uh, key things we have as Christians are ancient writings. Uh, from the early church and from the apostle, uh, you know, from the first century um, uh, and the early days of Christianity, the church fathers and so forth, that give us insights into, you know, what were the practices back then and and so forth. And I would just say that nothing substantive, in my view, has been sacrificed at all. Sometime after you couldn't disprove the resurrection, you decided to change professions. You became a pastor. Did anyone try to talk you out of it? <laughs> yeah, my Christian friends tried to talk me out of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I trained my whole life to be a journalist and was successful in that career. And then um, I was um, feeling called to leave that and take a 60% pay cut and join the staff of a church. And um, my, several of my Christian friends said, how are you going to do that? How are you going to put your kids through college? You can't live on that small amount of money. I mean, this is not practical. What, what are you doing? And my atheist father-in-law, who, by the way, came to faith in Jesus on his deathbed, but my atheist father-in-law said to me, you know, Lee, if you think that's what you ought to do, you ought to do it. <laughs> so I thought it was interesting. And some of my Christian friends were a little hesitant for me to take such a huge pay cut and um, uh, leave what I was comfortable with for a whole new a quote unquote career in, in, um, uh, in the church world, but God was faithful. He took care of us. And, um, uh, it was the best decision I ever made to make that transition because I asked myself when I get to the end of my life and I put my head on the pillow for the last time, how am I going to feel about turning the other way when I felt God was calling me to leave this and to, join the staff of the church. How, how am I going to feel on my deathbed? And I thought, I can't, I, I don't want to face that. I, if I feel God's calling me, I don't care if I, I'm not getting paid anything. I, I, I got I to gotta take this path. Um, interestingly, my friend Luis Palau, one of the great evangelists of all time, who died recently, I was the last person to interview him before he died. And um, he said to me, Lee, when you get to the end of your life and all is said and done, you will never regret being courageous for Christ. And that's always echoed in my mind that when we face those paths in Christ, am I going to leave this career I'm comfortable in and successful in and take a 60% pay cut and walk down a path I don't know where it leads? You know what? I want to be courageous for Christ. And if, if I believe he's leading me, I, that's the direction I'm going to go. And I'm just going to trust him. And it's been the greatest adventure of my life um, to be able to write about him and tell people about him and to speak about him um, and, and, and see people come to faith and see their lives and eternities transformed right before my eyes. That's been the greatest joy of my life. Your your fa atheist father in law saying to take a sixty percent pay cut is enough of a miracle. Right then, you should have known. Yeah, <laughs> that's, <mentioned right>. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point. He should have. He should have said, "Whoa, wait a minute." <laughs> yeah, he came to faith in the last conversation in his life before he died. I, I shared the gospel with him. 
I was just going to ask you to please share that story about your father-in-law because it's so powerful. Yeah, he had had a series of strokes. They told us he was going to die. Um, he was at home in hospice. And I told my wife and his wife, who was a Christian, his wife was a Christian. I said, you guys go out. I, give me one more shot at him. And I sat him down. And I said, Al, you know you're dying, right? I don't want to be in heaven without you. Your daughter, your, your wife, we don't want to be in heaven without you. Your grandchildren don't want to be in heaven without you. Al, please. And I reasoned with him and I cajoled him and I shared the gospel with him for about 45 minutes. And then I could see a softening in his countenance. And I said, you want to receive Christ right now, don't you? And he had tears in his eyes and he said, yeah, I do. And so after 87 or so years as an atheist, he confessed his sin, repented, re received forgiveness through Christ and became a child of God. And um, his wife and my wife returned home and I gave him the good news. And we said, let's throw a party. And they started cooking dinner. And then we noticed something was wrong with Al. He was, his right side was sagging and we realized he's having another stroke. So we called the ambulance and um, my wife got in the ambulance with him, got to the emergency room. They put him on a gurney. And as I took him into the emergency room, he looked up at my wife and said, tell Lee thanks. And they took him in and he lingered for a while, but the, the stroke destroyed his mind and he ended up dying. So in the last cogent conversation of his life, after 80 plus years of rejecting God, he was saved, he was redeemed, he was forgiven, and he's in heaven right now and I'll spend eternity with him. And um, that's, that's the outrageous nature of the grace of God that it is big enough even to cover those who in the last moments of their life realize, oh, I've made a mistake. I was wrong. God, I want you. I want to know you. I want to spend eternity with you. That God even answers that desperate prayer in the closing moments of a person's life. Um, I, I think that's a reflection of how great and deep and wide and beautiful the grace of God is. I read that you moved to California and I noticed that the congregation you led was right near where your son went to college. Was that the motivation to move? No, um, I was offered a position as a teaching pastor at a, a large church in California um, where I could write books and still be a pastor at the church, which is kind of an unusual situation. And so we moved out to California to do that. Uh, my son, uh, who was who was a problem kid growing up? Oh my gosh! I remember getting a call from the police. Oh yeah, we have your son. <laughs> he was in. He was a. He was a piece of work, and um, God got a hold of him on a short term mission trip to the Dominican Republic between high school and college, and he, God got a hold of his life. He got an undergraduate degree in biblical studies. Uh, then he got a master's degree in philosophy of religion, another master's degree in New Testament, another master's degree in, um, um, what's the third one in? I can't even remember what the third one is in. Then he got a PhD in theology at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. And now he's a professor at one of the largest seminaries in America, teaching future pastors about Jesus Christ. And um, I, I tell that to parents who have teenagers who are driving them nuts. <laughs> And Kyle drove me nuts. I didn't know what to do. He was driving me crazy, but God got a hold of him and look what happened. And uh, my daughter's serving the Lord as well. She's uh, now my grandkids one by one have come to faith. So it's really changed the whole, the whole trajectory of our family. Lee, you've had many exciting things happen to you since you have written The Case for Christ. Besides the most important and obvious, your salvation, and the preservation of your family. You hosted a very successful television program. You've had a movie made about your story, and you've written over three dozen books. Many have been award-winning. So which of those have been the most fun for you? Well, of course, family's been great fun. But to me, the greatest satisfaction, uh, and it happened to me just yesterday, uh, where I get an email from someone who I didn't, don't know. This was from a young man, 16 years old. He'd lost his faith. And um, 
he watched the movie, The Case for Christ, and read the book and came back to faith in Christ. That to me is the most fun. I mean, the stories that I get from people are just so fulfilling. I think of Evil Knievel, the great motorcycle daredevil rider who lived a very immoral life. And he was a gambler. He was a womanizer. And how God spoke to him in his later years and said, Robert, I've saved you more times than you'll ever know. Now you need to come to me through my son, Jesus. And he, he, he had this experience on the beach in Florida. He didn't know what to do. So he called the only Christian he knew uh, who was the sportscaster, Kathy Lee Gifford's husband, Frank Gifford. He called Frank Gifford, the sportscaster, and said, Frank, you're a Christian. I just had this experience. W- who's Jesus? And Frank said, get that book, Case for Christ. That'll I'll explain the whole thing to you. So, so Evil Knievel gets my book. He ends up radically born again. He ends up to be probably the biggest 180 degree change in a human being that I've ever seen. Um, Follower of Jesus. Um, Couldn't stop talking about Jesus. Couldn't stop telling other people about Jesus. When he was baptized, he told his story of how God had changed his life through Jesus Christ. And 700 people responded by coming to faith th- that day. Um, so we became friends. He called me up um, and to thank me for writing the case for Christ. And I remember answering the phone. I said, this is Lee. And the voice said, is this Lee Strobel? I said, yeah. He said, this is evil. And I thought, my gosh, <laughs> Satan has got my phone number. Is that even possible? Can he do that? I said, no, it's evil. Can- oh, evil can evil. Oh, yeah. I used to have your lunchbox when I was a little kid. And um, he told me the story of how God used my book in his life. We became good friends. And um, when he died a couple of years later, uh, on his tombstone, uh, he, at his request, he had the words etched, uh, believe in Jesus Christ. Um, so he was a radical. But those stories, I just, I love them so much because I know it's not me. It's the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit, working through the gospel, changing lives, changing eternities. And I know the implications for them and for their families, for their future, for their eternity. And um, so I just, that's, that's the most fun to me is getting those stories and, and, and hearing those accounts. Could you please tell us about your wife and kids? I'm encouraging you to brag. Yeah, <laughs> you know, as you, we said earlier, my wife and I met at 14. We've been best friends all these years, 52 years of marriage. She's still the love of my life. Um, and, and my grandkids and my kids, to see how they've served God and, and love God and how their families are so devoted. And um, to see the grandkids coming to faith one by one, to see them baptized, to see their lives open up. Um to see my 18 year old granddaughter fall in love with a young Christian man. Uh, and who knows where that's going to (laughs) lead. So, um, yeah, family to me, has just been, it's, it's been so great. It's been, um, so comfortable for me in the sense that my wife was my best friend before we were married and that's different kind of relationship. Um, um, so yeah, it's it's been awesome. It's been awesome. I I can't wait to get great grandkids. That's my next. Uh, <laughs> my eighteen year old granddaughter says she wants to have her first baby when she's twenty three. So I'm thinking, yeah, let's do it. Let's get this done. <laughs> we'll have to have an accidental. Uh, you had the accidental phone call to get married. You'll have to have an accidental text message for her. That's right. Know. That's right. I should <laughs> I should text right here. You and Aiden are getting married. <laughs> Now on to our final word segment, where we ask our guests a few rapid fire questions. What was the happiest moment in your life? November the 8th of 1981, when I got on my knees, confessed my sins, received forgiveness through Christ, uh, and and knew that I was now adopted as his son forever. That was the happiest moment in my life. What is the biggest adversity you faced? Well, I've had some health challenges. you know, I almost died in 2011. Um, I'm currently undergoing a lot of medical tests because of a, an anomaly in my heart um, that is uh, causing some issues. Um, so, and my wife has an incurable neuromuscular condition called fibromyalgia that uh, has 
has had her in pain now for 20 years. So we've, we've had, you know, some health challenges that have been um, something we've had to go to God with and trust him in and uh, see that he can even draw good from the struggles that we have with our health. You know, when I think um, of, of Romans 8, 28 says, God can cause all things to work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And he used to scoff at that until somebody said to me, Lee, don't you realize Jesus took the worst thing that could ever happen in the universe, the death of the son of God in the cross. And from that produced the best thing that can ever happen in the universe, which is the opening of heaven to all who follow him. And if God can take the worst thing in the universe and turn it into the best thing in the universe, he can even take the struggles that you go through and draw good from them. And and that was a real wake up call for me that um, even in the challenges that we face, that uh, God can still accomplish good through them, even if that good is often um, uh, teaching us lessons that we otherwise could never have learned. What are you most excited about? Oh, uh, grand, great grandkids. <laughs> no, um, you know, I'm always working on a new book. I have a new book I just finished a couple of weeks ago. It comes out next March. It's called Seeing the Supernatural. And it's a book that looks at the question, how do we know that there's more to reality than that, that which we can see and touch? How, how do I know that if uh, something exists beyond this world, how do I know that there is a heaven? How do I know that there is a realm beyond this? How do I know that angels are real? How do I know that demons are real? And so I've written this book called um, uh, Seeing the Supernatural. And uh, I can't wait for people to read and interact with that. I, I'm a writer. I love writing books. And I just hope I can just keep doing that. I, I enjoy it. It feeds me. And it causes me to learn and grow in a way that nothing else quite accomplishes. The name of our podcast is Nothing Left Unsaid. Do you have anything you want to say? Oh, boy. Uh, just uh, Tim and Troy, thanks for creating this platform for people to talk about important things. Um, thanks for exploring really important topics and issues. Um, and thanks for kind of taking your viewers on a journey with you as you explore difficult and challenging often questions of life. Um, so thanks for what you're doing. Um, um, I, I don't know how well I was able to answer your questions. I hope it was helpful for somebody, but um, I've, enjoy, I've enjoyed meeting you guys and uh, and praying for both of you. That selfishly, I don't, I don't care how the episode does. I got a lot of my questions answered. So I'm oh, good. that's good. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys are awesome. It was such a pleasure to talk to you today. Like you, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. When Troy came to me with the idea for this podcast, I had two conditions. One is that we helped raise money and awareness for ALS. Second was that I had an opportunity to witness for Jesus in every episode. That's awesome. I love that. Those are, those are two very worthy goals for the podcast. Lee, last question and we'll let you go is, um, one of the things that we've done is at the end of every episode, we didn't want the podcast to be just about ALS or just about religion or just about football and my dad's back on our athletics. So at the end of every episode, we ask our guests, who are a couple of people that you know personally that you think we should try to have on to tell their story? Oh, that's a great question. Stephen McWhorter is one of them. He was a meth addict. His dad was a pastor. He grew up, he hated the church, hated Christianity. Um, he became a meth addict um, and he... One night, he'd read my book, Case for Christ, as it turns out. But one night, he was in the midst of all his drug paraphernalia, and he called out to God. He said, God, help me. Help me. God redeemed him at that moment, changed his life. He now writes worship songs, and he's a worship leader um, and, and a great guy, real character. Uh, he would be wonderful. Um, Sarah Silviander is a Ph.D. in astrophysics at uh, the University of Texas. She grew up as an atheist. And um, it was her, her study of astrophysics that led her to the Lord. And she has a great story as well. Um, golly, there's so many. 
the reason I ask uh, um, in my book, The Case for um, uh, or Is God Real? In the introduction, I mentioned some real brief stories about some people I know who've had incredible life transformations like that. I wish Evil Knievel were still alive. Um, <laughs> here's one, Billy Moore. Billy Moore murdered a guy when he was a youngster and was sentenced to death row. Came down to the point to be executed. But in the, inter- in the intervening years, he came to faith in Christ. He took 33 correspondence courses from a Bible college. He was radically transformed so much that on the eve of his execution, just hours to go before he was executed, the state of Georgia decided to let him go. He is wow. now a pastor of a church in Rome, Georgia, um, serves at, at that church as one of the pastors between two public housing projects, radically transformed. I've never seen a case in American history. Often they'll commute the sentence of someone on death row, um, but to not only commute the sentence, but to let him go, unbelievable. Wow. He's a good friend of mine, and he talks about how God changed his life. Um, gosh, there's so many so many great stories. Those are, those are a few. That's awesome. Thanks so much. Really appreciate the time. And, sure. Uh, and the stories and the wisdom. Well, I appreciate it, Tim. Great to meet you. Great to meet you, Troy. And uh, blessings on you both. Barkley Damon LLP is proud to be the law firm sponsor of Tim Green's podcast, Nothing Left Unsaid. For more on Barkley Damon's team of nearly 300 attorneys with regional, national, and global reach from our offices across the Northeastern US, Washington, DC, and Toronto, go to BarkleyDamon.com. I want to thank my partners at Barkley Damon for supporting this podcast and of course Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com. For cutting edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital, if you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.